screen here first. That's the most important thing. And make sure I get this right this time. I think this should work now. I think I see something about to show. Okay. So yeah, so I mean, the title of my presentation is Building Canada's Hydrogen Value Chain Through a Hub-Based Approach. I, I give a number of talks, uh, you know, to regional partners, national partners. So, you know, trying to show a little bit of a, a national flavor in this in this uh, presentation, but really is it will zoom into the Edmonton region and why we're so excited about the hydrogen opportunity here. I'll talk a bit about my organization, Edmonton Global. Um, you know, this isn't going to be a technical talk. I have a few slides that others have put been put uh, uh, developed, and I'll be using their slides just to provide a bit of context. Uh, but you know, happy as you get into the Q's and A's a bit later. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer highly technical questions, but uh, you know, we get into uh, you know the different types of hydrogen and the the uh, you know characteristics of hydrogen. Be happy to kind of begin that conversation. So I'll just keep going here. Um, just about Edmonton Global, my organization. We're not Global Edmonton News. That's usually the first thing that people say. Are we on the camera today? And no, uh, just me on the camera. But um, Edmonton Global is a relatively new organization. We were established in 2018, uh, you know, as an attempt across the region, not just the city of Edmonton, but uh, a number of municipal partners. We represent 14 municipalities, and you can kind of see the uh, the various uh, cities, towns on this map, the counties that we work with, and it's been a concerted effort uh, amongst all of these municipal partners to come together to pursue economic development within the region. I think in the past, it would have been the city of Edmonton. Sometimes we're competing to attract investment, and we might have been competing with Strathcona County or the city of St. Albert in some cases. Um, and yeah, as Manfred said, uh, Con uh, Concordia is a great partner with Edmonton Global as well and making sure we can harness the horsepower of all of our post-secondary institutions across this region to support economic development. So at the end of the day, you know, I'm measured by things like investment attraction to the region, supporting trade, uh, economic activity. And we think hydrogen is one of a number of real uh, important uh, transformational opportunities so it's not about small incremental change we're about you know radical transformation uh, in key focus areas so one being hydrogen that i'll be getting into around you know clean energy decarbonization that's all part of the conversation other focus areas we work on are life sciences or how you say health and life sciences global logistics uh, food and agriculture uh, and and technology as a bit of an enabler across all sectors, artificial intelligence, machine learning being being one major area, uh, but other other technologies as well. So I'll be focused on hydrogen today, but uh, just to give you a bit of background on what we're all about. So again, we work with 14 municipal partners, uh, and uh, we have a independent board of directors as well at Edmonton Global. So just kind of to, to put a bit of context, why do we even want to talk about hydrogen? Why aren't we talking about natural gas? Why aren't we talking about some other energy uh, uh, energy carriers or energy uh, energy commodities? And this is a slide put together by a group called the Transition Accelerator. They're a national not-for-profit uh, foundation that's doing a lot of work to support uh, sort of the decarbonization agenda across Canada. And they've been really a leader in a lot of the work we do on hydrogen and uh, understanding the techno-economics around the hydrogen economy. But but they often start a presentation with, with this type of slide, which is, you know, now that we're talking about, um, you know, moving towards net zero targets by 2050, in some cases even earlier than 2050, airports, for example, uh, in Edmonton is focused on a 2040 net zero target. Uh, it kind of changes the game. You know, it's no longer about incremental improvement. It's really about transformational, you know, transformational change to decarbonize across sectors, across governments, across municipalities. So, you know, rather than this portfolio, you'll see on the left of, you know, we have energy from natural gas, from gasoline, diesel, electricity, and others, uh, you know, by the 2050 timeframe, or maybe earlier, you know, we need to be moving towards, you know, much more significant role for electrification, uh, assuming your electricity is coming from, uh, you know, renewable sources or zero emission sources. Um, but not every sector can electrify. So some uh, this won't make sense. It won't be uh, uh, technically as feasible for them. It won't achieve their desired outcome. So things like hydrogen become much more important for some sectors. And that's what we'll be talking a bit more about today. There will still be a role for fossil fuels in the, within the system for different types of products that come from or derived from fossil fuels, uh, ideally with um, things like carbon capture and storage playing a major role in in the decarbonization of fossil fuels biomass may have a role probably not as you know large a role as hydrogen and electricity just because of the availability of biomass it becomes difficult difficult to move it around 
Um, so you get a bit of a sense, what does that, that shift look like? This isn't meant to be exact, you know, it's going to be 40% or 30%, but um, just on my next slide, you know, we do think it, hydrogen does play a major role for Canada, uh, you know, particularly compared to some other jurisdictions around the world. So some of these numbers come from the Canadian uh, hydrogen strategy that was released over two years ago now. And uh, they talk about this being, you know, really, you know, a, a huge opportunity for Canada. They would like Canada to be in the top three as far as global production and use of hydrogen, uh, you know, across the world. But we're not there yet. But if we can make this shift over, uh, the feeling is hydrogen represents for Canada around a hundred billion dollar economic opportunity. And that's split pretty much evenly between the export opportunity to get hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives like ammonia to international markets that are, are, that are asking for it. And also the domestic hydrogen market that might be a, similarly about $50 billion. Uh, the Canadian strategy estimates that could you know, result in about 350,000 new jobs around this hydrogen economy across all of Canada by 2050. Uh, you know, the global market is massive. This, uh, I, I used to kind of just put $2 trillion down, and then I've been seeing some studies that, that talk about $11 trillion, and I, I lose track of my trillions after a while. I can't really fathom what a trillion dollars even is sometimes, but it, we know it's huge. I mean, this is all part of that, that global decarbonization agenda and what the size of that, uh, that activity looks like. And for Canada, it is pretty significant. So because of the nature of our economy, the nor northern cl or cold climate, uh, the large distances between urban centers, hydrogen can play probably a larger role than other uh, maybe more densely populated jurisdictions. So for Canada, it's about 30% of our energy mix could be hydrogen by 2050. So that's pretty significant. And for some sectors like cement, steel, uh, long haul trucking, I'll be talking more about that in this presentation. Hydrogen could be a, play a very major role in those sectors as, as part of their decarbonization carbonization goals and just those bullets on the top you know we do think it's a great opportunity for Canada given things like the feedstocks that we have you know I'll talk about Alberta what we have in terms of natural gas but we also have renewable electricity other parts of Canada Quebec Ontario British Columbia have different energy mixes you know all can play uh, or hydrogen can be an important role for for those as well as you look to uh, you know things like hydropower in Quebec and how that can support the hydrogen economy in that province we don't necessarily have the same opportunities but they're different and each are quite unique um, you know, we've been an energy innovation leader. I think this is a great area. We're getting a lot of interest from countries around the world in what we're doing on hydrogen, uh, building off of our strong energy sector, which is a pretty good fit. You know, when we talk about how we produce hydrogen, move hydrogen around, we have a lot of that knowledge already around here. And I'll, I'll speak a bit about that. Uh, great international collaboration. You know, we can access more markets from uh, Canada than probably any other jurisdiction around the world. And we have pretty good experience in deploying some related technologies, things like carbon capture and storage, which I'll get into as well. So kind of zooming now down to the region that with I represent again, you know, we see huge opportunities within this region. And, you know, we talk about the entire hydrogen value chain. So this is just a bit of a cartoon we've put together or some icons, you know, showing almost in every part of our region, there's there's opportunities that are very unique for them to play a, a large role in the hydrogen economy from producing hydrogen up in the industrial heartland area, for example, you know, all the way through to our municipalities, our post-secondary institutions like Concordia that can play a large role. Uh, given the knowledge and expertise that we have here in different parts of the hydrogen value chain, all the way through to things like, you know, the maintenance facilities for heavy duty equipment, which we do a lot of already in, let's say, parts of Parkland County or, or parts of uh, NISCU. So the, all those regions, you know, can play a major role in this transformation and derive value. And then we even want to get into more uh, you know, more value added activity, things like the uh, the fabrication or the assembly of some of this equipment that's going to be required in, in sectors like heavy duty. So, I mean, this is really a next slide is a bit of a high level summary. You know, why is this Edmonton region so so focused on it? What do we have to offer? And I'll speak about each of these in a bit more detail, but we have a pretty strong policy framework that's emerging, high degree of alignment across governments. This isn't always the case, as you know, in in Alberta, where we don't always agree with the federal government on things, but uh, we've heard our provincial ministers say there's really, you know, we're, we're working side by side with the federal government around the hydrogen opportunity. So, you know, really strong alignment. We all realize this is a big prize. We have to work together uh, to succeed in, in achieving. Uh, you know, we're starting from very low cost feedstocks, things like natural gas, which is highly discounted in Alberta compared to other parts of North America. I have a chart on that in a moment. 
Uh, obviously, the expertise I've already spoken about, uh, the world-class carbon capture and storage capabilities, and those just keep on moving further forward uh, with some of the recent policy decisions from the Alberta government on how to support CO2 hubs. Uh, great access to markets uh, from Edmonton in particular to two western ports, Prince Rupert in particular, but also Vancouver. Good access east-west on the, the transportation corridors as well as north-south, and north-south will continue to be very important. Um, and obviously a very diversified industrial base that we already have compared to other parts of Canada, even parts of Alberta, you know, Calgary, you might think, well, what are they doing on hydrogen? But, you know, we've got such a, a stronger industry base here in Edmonton that can play a large role in this, uh, this shift over into the hydrogen economy. So when we talk about policy alignment, I just put up uh, you know, a graphic to show some of the key strategies. So if you're from the social sciences, this, this might be important. I'm a political science guy when I went to school. So, you know, I was all excited about policies. So, you know, this kind of shows we have national policies at the federal government level. We have uh, provincial roadmaps, policies, and we have things at the regional level with our Alberta industrial heartland. That's the area Northeast uh, includes Edmonton in the Northeast portion of it, as well as uh, counties of Strathcona, where we have Sherwood Park, for example, and uh, Surgeon County, uh, uh, Lamont and uh, uh, city of Port Saskatchewan. So those mayors from those regions came together under the Alberta Industrial Heartland uh, organization to uh, to launch a hydrogen task force. That's around three years ago or more now. And it was really that level at the regional the regional level that informed the development of a provincial hydrogen uh, well, hydrogen roadmap. Eventually, at first it was the natural gas strategy and vision that recognized the opportunity for hydrogen and also the Canadian strategy from two years ago. So rather than thinking of this as top down, it was the federal government saying hydrogen's important. What are you going to do provincially? It was really the bottom up. It was the region saying this is a huge opportunity. And two years ago, three years ago, people weren't really talking hydrogen. And right now you can't have a conversation where it on energy where it really doesn't come up. So it's been an incredible amount of, of growth and activity in those two or three years. And I would credit the industrial heartland uh, for leading that charge and getting this uh, opportunity higher on the national agenda agenda and the provincial agenda. And that policy alignment I talked about has now really been reflected in some financial or some funding decisions that have been made, not just by governments, but with some of the largest hydrogen companies in the world. In fact, the largest company, Air Products, uh, they're US based. They're pursuing you know, massive hydrogen projects around the world. Uh, again, the world's largest hydrogen production uh, or producer. And they've chose Edmonton as a location for one of their flagship investments in a net zero hydrogen facility. So I'll maybe get into net zero. Um, you know, historically producing hydrogen results in massive amounts of greenhouse gas emissions when you do it from natural gas um, and let the CO2 go back into the atmosphere. But now with carbon capture and storage and some of the more advanced technologies and even looking at internal use of some of the hydrogen within the facility, you can actually get to a net zero uh, number. And that's what Air Products has done. And this is their first world scale net zero project that they've announced for Edmonton, just on the east side, just as you kind of butt up against the uh, Strathcona County boundary with Sherwood Park. So if you know where the Waste Management Center is in Edmonton, it's really very close to that location. So a great location, good access to pipelines, to other transportation infrastructure, natural gas, obviously. And they've chose for a $1.6 billion facility to be located there. They're planning on constructing that over the next two years. And they have provincial funding and federal government funding to the tune of about a uh, $461 million. So, you know, maybe around a third or so of the overall project. And we'll get into some of the incentives that are in place as well across Canada for hydrogen, because that's a hot topic right now, trying to keep up with what the U.S. is doing on incentives. Um, so that's really been our starting point, you know, the being able to attract these types of production investments to the region. Now, the, the you know, the the opportunities, what do we do with this? We can, you know, we can produce hydrogen for a big industry, but we can do a lot of other things with hydrogen. And our products is one company that's looking to uh, expand across that value chain as well. So I mentioned policies and incentives. This is just a snapshot. I'm not going to go through this list, but to show uh, the federal government does have a wide range of incentives in place. These are a growing list every month. There's probably something new popping up. I've got a new investment tax credit for clean hydrogen. That's in the development phase. Uh, the federal government has been seeking consultation on what that should look like. The reason they're doing this is to try and keep pace with the United States. Uh, the Biden administration uh, announced the inflation Reduction Act or IRA uh, back in the summertime. And that's really changed the entire landscape for not only hydrogen, but other uh, clean fuels, uh, 
renewable power. So the the production incentives that the U.S. is putting in place is kind of causing a, everyone to to take note whether you're in Europe or in Asia, or even in Canada. You know whether that's a, now a stronger uh, a base for future activity around hydrogen. So how do we keep up with that in Canada? So we'll be expecting to hear more from the federal government at the next budget around how they plan to respond. But you see other incentives here for transportation infrastructure, for example, zero emission vehicles, other types of infrastructure. The Alberta government also has incentives through the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. That's how they got to that 160 million uh, commitment towards the Air Product Project, but they're looking at other uh, other projects as well. We have our research and innovation system in Alberta through Emissions Reduction Alberta and Alberta Innovates and their Clean Hydrogen Center of Excellence. So lots of tools coming up over the past year or two, new programs uh, being announced on a regular basis, provincially, federally, and even at the municipal level through our Hydrogen Hub and uh, things like our Heartland Incentive Program, you know, additional uh, supports for some of these types of projects. So I'm just going to spend a moment on, you know, again, why is this a competitive area for, for Alberta, for Canada? This is a study, uh, uh, some data from a study. It's a little bit old now. It's 2018, so it probably does require a bit of an update. But it was a, a study done looking at the Asia-Pacific region in particular and where hydrogen could come from, what technologies can produce hydrogen and at what cost. So this study found that uh, when you went through the laundry list of all the different producers of hydrogen, the different technologies, particularly to get to low carbon hydrogen, you know, the, probably the lowest cost producer in the world is is uh, Russia at that point in time. Very cheap natural gas in Russia. Uh, they claim their CCS. I've been working on carbon capture and storage. I'm not really aware of many Russian projects, so I'm I'm a bit skeptical of you know Russia saying they can meet that. Uh, low carbon target but look at the number two canada with natural gas plus carbon capture and storage at about a dollar 50 a kilogram hydrogen so that's a very low cost particularly compared to other technologies where renewable power may be used to produce hydrogen or other technologies so we've got a great starting point in canada as being you know if not the world's lowest cost producer one of the world's you know top two low cost producers of hydrogen so how do we convert that into a real opportunity to get it to global markets and to make use of it within your domestic markets. So, you know, you see this blue wedge, you know, that's the retail cost of diesel. So it costs a lot to move hydrogen today uh, by trucks, for example. So how do we look at uh, some common investments in infrastructure to get that cost down to let our sectors, you know, access that low cost resource? And this next chart, if you're an economist uh, or you like your energy numbers, really just shows why, again, we're fairly low cost in Alberta. And this is the cost of natural gas. The red is the Alberta natural gas uh, uh, price over the last oh, about seven years or so. And the gray is what they call the Henry Hub average. That's sort of the, the North American price that's uh, that's the, the marker that's set. And you'll see that our natural gas trades significantly lower than that North American spot price, Henry Hub. Um, you know, several dollars lower in some cases. And you'll see just in the last year or so that wedge getting really significant. So, you know, we have a, a almost call it stranded natural gas because we produce natural gas in this region for some other applications. So it allows, you know, almost to be treated as a waste in some instances. So you can access this natural gas at a much lower price. So what can you do with that? Hydrogen is one of the things you can you can produce from that natural gas. So that's a bit of an advantage. Uh, that, that gap is going to continue for the foreseeable future. So it, it's a great uh, way we can attract more companies to this region, provided we have the carbon capture and storage capabilities. And, um, you know, this is a slide from the Alberta Hydrogen Roadmap about a year and a half ago, which kind of takes that same information, puts a bit of a different twist on it, where they're looking at different types of uh, hydrogen production technologies. SMR is steam methane reforming, as opposed to small modular reactors. There's two SMR uh, energy systems, but I'm talking about steam methane reforming. That's been the traditional way of producing hydrogen in the past. And then one of the lower cost ways. Uh, so again, if you look at the yellow, that's the global average uh, associated with that technology. The blue diamond is the Alberta cost of doing that. This is from a U of A study uh, undertaken in 2021 through their future energy systems team over there. So again, you can see Alberta can produce at a much lower cost, whether it's steep methane reforming uh, without carbon capture, certainly with carbon capture. And the next technology that's being pursued is ATR, that's auto thermal reforming. And that's what that air products project is making use of. It gives you a higher degree of carbon capture, and that's gonna be really important to allow you to hit some of the international targets uh, around clean hydrogen production. So again, we're really breaking ground here. This talks about 91%, air products actually talks 95% carbon capture. 
and then that remaining 5% you know, using using it internally to offset the electricity you may have been pulling off the grid, which would be at a fairly high carbon intensity in Alberta. And compared to wind-based electrolysis, solar electrolysis, you know, those are important technologies around the world. They're getting a lot of attention right now. There is a feeling they will scale very quickly. Some are saying, you know, over the next 20 years, those costs are going to come down to maybe the same level. My own view is they have a lot of work to do still. There's still challenges around, uh, you know, uh, having enough renewable electricity and the other demands for renewable electricity. So you may see that take off in some jurisdictions, the Middle East, Australia, a little more challenge in other parts of the world. So, you know, we do have this great starting point. Uh, everyone's catching up, but at the same time, our technologies here in Alberta are continuing to evolve and becoming more competitive. And you can see on the right, you know, this is the European uh, standard for carbon intensity around hydrogen production and obviously you know wind-based electrolysis well below those uh, those standards but even uh, atr again autothermal reforming plus carbon capture and storage keeps you below those international standards so we can provide this product to a, a european market a global market and meet the standards that have been put in place one thing to keep in mind is that we, it will be very important as to how you produce your natural gas. So if you have fugitive uh, vented methane emissions from natural gas production, no, those could impact your ability to achieve these numbers. Thankfully, in Alberta, you know, our natural gas management uh, regime is very strong compared to the United States, compared to other parts of Canada, compared to other parts of the world. So when you might hear about, oh, yeah, but what about all that uh, you know, the natural gas uh, or methane emissions that, that go up back up into the atmosphere with a high global warming potential. Um, you know, they might be quoting numbers that maybe are coming from other parts of the world that aren't realistic for what uh, how methane is managed in Alberta. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, I won't spend too much time on this one, but just a bit of a laundry list of the projects that are in this region. Again, I'm an economic development organization, so we do like to talk about some of these world leading companies that are investing here in Alberta. So I've talked a bit about that and some of the enablers to those investments are things like existing pipeline infrastructure, existing carbon capture and storage infrastructure. So you're seeing, you know, some major international companies making large investments. You know, we feel it's potentially $30 billion or more of investments over the next uh, 10 years in hydrogen, in clean ammonia for the international markets. Even companies like Dow, or they're not producing hydrogen for export, but they're using hydrogen internally to, uh, to really offset or I, I, not a offset, but to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions within their operations. So Dow has a global fleet of you know, ethylene production facilities. They're choosing Fort Saskatchewan facility just east of Edmonton as where they're going to uh, you know, make a massive investment in decarbonization, making use of hydrogen internally for their, their production processes. And what they can do in Edmonton is actually allowing them to achieve, I think around a 25% or so, uh, reduction in their global fleet. So again, you can achieve a lot by focusing on some facilities like the ones here in the Edmonton region uh, to achieve your your uh, broader reductions. Um, just uh, since we're talking a bit about export, what I do like to highlight, uh, some people have seen, understand this fairly well. Others, this is a bit of a shock when they see these these numbers that we can get products to global markets, particularly Asia, just as quickly, uh, definitely as parts of the United States, much more quickly than the US, in fact, um, going through the Gulf Coast, going through Los Angeles or Seattle, but we can get product from, let's say, Prince Rupert, which is our key port for uh, you know moving energy commodities or Kitimat, those areas, to Japan, to South Korea in around 11 days. So that's less than moving it from the Middle East uh, to those same markets. It's about the same as Australia. There's a lot of focus right now on Australia, but we're really just as close. And it's actually uh, much safer routes, uh, avoiding some of the geopolitical challenges of going through the South China Sea, for example. So something that's not well understood, and we're really, really leveraging that opportunity that we have uh, in Prince Rupert. That's really the Edmonton port we call it because CN Rail moves very quickly and efficiently from this region to Prince Rupert so uh, that will be receiving more attention as we get into this uh, this hydrogen export opportunity and just on carbon capture and storage a, a bit more information I just wanted to highlight uh, you know really important for this region in particular we've been working on carbon capture and storage for a long time that was one of my past jobs was uh, coordinating a lot of the research on on CCUS uh, about 15 years ago and we've been at it for to be honest probably 30 years uh, understanding this technology and it's now been pursued at a commercial scale just outside the Edmonton area for the last seven years with projects like Shell 
where they've been uh, car capturing carbon off their hydrogen production facility at Scotford and injecting that deep down two kilometers underground into the basal Cambrian sandstone formation. So, you know, these are world-class projects that have been going on for, again, seven years. In that case, we have the Alberta carbon trunk line that's also moving hydrogen from northeast Edmonton area all the way down to the central Alberta, pretty close to Red Deer, where right now it's used for enhanced oil recovery. But that same infrastructure could also be used for straight storage uh, in, in, again, deep, safe geological formations. And what this picture is showing you is now there's been an effort to uh, establish CO2 hubs across the region, across all of Alberta. There's actually 19 across Alberta, but this all started in the Edmonton region where we have six CO2 hubs. So if you're a producer uh, of, of, of any commodity where there's significant amounts of uh, CO2 being emitted uh, that can be captured, you will have an operator that you can work with to store your CO2. So it's really kind of changing the game as far as uh, being able to advance uh, large scale industrial projects and having other companies that can look after your CO2. And this is just the same map, a bit, bit of a different way to look at it. Uh, again, Edmonton, that gray box in the upper center, you know, surrounded essentially by great uh, geological formations, in, in particularly the, the basal Cambrian sandstone, two kilometers below the surface, uh, where Shell is already injecting and where some of these new uh, proposals are all uh, focused. So I think you'll see a lot of activity in this region, very large swaths of land uh, around CO2 storage. Uh, but other ones across as we get closer down to Calgary as well. So just moving off to other types of hydrogen, uh, you know, really what I want to focus is a bit of a comparison because we are very uh, bullish, I guess, on being able to produce hydrogen, clean hydrogen at a world-class scale. So, you know, we talk about air products. This is the numbers associated with their facility, about 547,000 tons per year. That'll be completed late 2024. Um, how does that compare to other types of hydrogen, hydrogen from renewable electricity through an electrolysis based process? So I've just put a couple of examples. These are some of the largest, what they'll call green hydrogen production projects in the world. One uh, operated or being developed by Shell in, in Rotterdam, Netherlands, another one in China. And you'll see that the volumes that they're talking about, about 22,000, 20,000 tons per year. That's 1 25th the size of this air products facility. And that's just one facility in Edmonton. We have many others uh, on the on the proposals. So not that these aren't important, they are gonna scale, but we're, st we're at a starting point that's 25 times larger. So how do we leverage that ability to build out this critical infrastructure that we're gonna need in hydrogen across the entire economy? And again, other types of hydrogen are being produced even in this region itself. And we have some great technologies coming out of our post-secondary institutions. Um, one area is called methane pyrolysis. And again, I'm not the engineer, but basically taking natural gas, but instead of using carbon capture and storage technology, if you don't have access to great geology like we do, or if you're looking for a more distributed system, you know, you can use that natural gas, use a pyrolysis based technology. And there's many different pyrolysis technologies being developed. Uh, they all result in some form of a solid carbon byproduct. And then the question becomes, well, what do you do with the solid carbon? Are there economic uses for it? Building materials, coatings, uh, those types of things, graphite, uh, or even using it for some, you know, reclamation purposes. So some interesting work going on on methane pyrolysis. Aurora is a U of A spinoff company. Econa is a British Columbia company uh, that's receiving some provincial support and they're looking to, uh, to uh, scale up their technology somewhere in Alberta. And we have one company out of Edmonton on the right. Uh, it was initially called SBI Bio. It still is, but they've got a subsidiary called uh, Gulu Technologies. And what they do is take an ethanol feedstock and they can convert that into hydrogen as well. So if you have access to ethanol, ethanol from, you know, uh, you know, low carbon sources, you know, that may be an interesting application as well. So they're looking at uh, some targeted markets for that technology. So I guess the point is, you know, I'll be focused a bit on on hydrogen from natural gas, natural gas and CCUS. But in fact, we've got kind of a good portfolio of technologies being developed in this region and being implemented. And it'll ultimately be all shapes and sizes. Some some consumers or users will be looking for a certain type of hydrogen that meets their own goals. It may be pyrolysis. It may be from renewables. It may be from ethanol or it may be these larger volumes from uh, natural gas and CCUS. So essentially what we're trying to do in the Edmonton region is, is leverage this ability to produce low cost, low carbon hydrogen at a significant scale and build out more uh, of that overall hydrogen value chain. So ideally by beginning to pipe, well not beginning, but eventually pipelining hydrogen, you know, across the region into some key use areas like mobility, power generation buildings, uh, 
blending projects, locomotive projects. We have all sorts of pilot projects taking place in this region. I'll, I'll speak a bit about those in a moment. Um, but you know, one of the things that we're we're hopeful about now is we'll see some liquid hydrogen production facilities, their products as part of their project. They'll be providing hydrogen for industrial users. Imperial, for example, is going to use their hydrogen for its uh, renewable diesel facility that was just announced yesterday. Actually, a a massive Imperial investment of I think around seven hundred million dollars. But they'll also have a liquid hydrogen facility, and that'll be the only one in Western Canada. So you will now have liquefied hydrogen that can be used for, in particular, mobility-related applications. So that kind of opens the door for a whole bunch of new activities here in this region to, su to supply liquid hydrogen for parts of, uh, again, the trucking sector, for example, the aviation sector, and other, other areas. So ultimately, it's, it's not just about using it, but we also want to use this for economic development to attract more companies to this region to locate, to access that, uh, that low carbon energy source, and even attracting companies like OEMs, not necessarily to, to build the entire trucks here, but some, some portion of their, their manufacturing and assembly activities could take place here if we can show we have enough demand and we'll be early users of hydrogen. So what we have now in Edmonton is a hydrogen hub. Uh, this is about a year and a half old. Uh, again, it really grew out of that industrial heartland task force that I showed earlier, and uh, it involves a large number of partners. So those five municipal governments are referenced here, as well as my organization, Edmonton Global, the Alberta Industrial Heartland, uh, the Transition Accelerator, which is doing much of this techno-economic analysis and pulling things together for the broader group, as well as federal provincial governments. And, and really important to highlight is two First Nation communities where we've got the chiefs of Enoch Cree First Nation, Alexander First Nation, uh, you know, participating on the leadership team of our hydrogen hub, because we do want to make sure we can provide benefit to uh, First Nation communities, maybe in a way that we haven't done in the past as we've developed other energy commodities. So, you know, particularly some of those business opportunities where they can play a, a large role. And what the hub has been doing is really creating a vision of, you know, how we see hydrogen being utilized within our ecosystem. Um, so we call it the strategic vision for 2032. And you can see on this chart, you know, an estimate of the number of trucks we, we think can be making use of hydrogen between now and 2032. That could be a fuel cell truck. We're seeing more of those just beginning in the early days of fuel cells to get into the market. We're testing some of those out on the roads. Our trucking sector is interested in learning more about fuel cells. But we also are excited by things like a dual fuel technology where you can really accelerate more hydrogen use through a much cheaper, cheaper low cost uh, engine system where you can use a portion of hydrogen with diesel and that will reduce your greenhouse gas emissions from transportation and begin allow you to make more use of hydrogen help develop the infrastructure in a more rapid manner uh, you need fueling stations we always hear about the chicken and egg with hydrogen well you need fuel to have the trucks the trucks uh, you know you won't have fueling stations until you have trucks and you won't have trucks until you have fueling stations but that's all moving ahead quite quite quickly right now and just yesterday the Alberta government issued a request for information from companies looking to support the development of a pro province-wide hydrogen refueling uh, infrastructure system. City of Edmonton's already moving down this pathway, so everyone's really beginning to think we're going to have some massive opportunities to, to advance this hydrogen economy in the next two years, as particularly as we get some of this liquid hydrogen entering into the system from air products and from other companies. Um, so you see on this chart, on the, or the map on the right, um, you know, this is really how we've clustered the different types of companies. We have a lot of trucking companies in the region. Those are the blue icons. Sorry, someone's turning my lights on and off outside. Um, and, uh, you know, trucking companies in the northeast, we have trucking companies in the west side of Edmonton along those transportation corridors. So that kind of gives you a sense where would be some great locations for refueling infrastructure. We have the airport down here on the bottom. The airport is doing a, a huge amount of work on hydrogen, looking at everything from hydrogen vehicles for taxi fleets, for car rental fleets, um, you know, through to make, making use of it with uh, their own uh, ground service vehicles at the airport. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just the, the transportation side. There's buildings, heat and power opportunities. So really trying to chart this all onto the map. And this is really the same information, just in a slightly different way to show it, uh, which is, um, uh, again, those numbers of vehicles we expect to see on the road by 2032. And you'll see, again, the starting point, is it really seems to be more in transportation up until about the mid-2030s. And then, you know, as we kind of get into 2030 and beyond, you'll see a, a larger role for uh, 
the heat and power sector to be making more use of hydrogen. That will depend on things like the carbon charge, the, the pace of acceleration of those, those charges and other technologies uh, that will be available for uh, the buildings and heat and power. And, you know, maybe just the last few slides I'm going to be showing are really some of the exciting things taking place in the Edmonton region. You know, I, I think of us as really the home to world leading pilot projects, you know, called the planes, trains and automobiles of hydrogen. And, and you know, we've, uh, you know, some really, you know, one of their kind initiatives taking place in Edmonton, in Alberta that we're really proud of. And we want to get that message out because this is helping to attract investment as well. Um, you'll see on the trucking side, you know, again, the trucks we have in Edmonton, moving Edmonton to Calgary, they're much larger. If you've been on the highway, you know, you see the these the massive trucks carrying, you know, two, even three trailers. So you, you may need some custom built trucks uh, that can make use of hydrogen. So there's a project called Azatech, uh, which is, uh, you know, working with a number of our trucking companies, our motor transport association, provincial governments to demonstrate, you know, these types of trucks on the road, because they really haven't been uh, construct uh, constructed, they haven't been uh, uh, built yet. Uh, we see other trucks around the world, but they're a little bit smaller. They'll have some niche applications, but for us, we need to really have these trucks that can carry massive loads and operate under the conditions here and the distances that we have to deal with within our trucking sector. And there'll be a road show taking place that is going to be launched probably next week, actually, or the week after, I, I believe. Uh, February 10th is the date where the trucking companies will start to make uh, get get a chance to have hands-on experience with hydrogen fuel cell trucks, dual fuel trucks, and so on. Uh, we've got two hydrogen fuel cell buses also that have now uh, they're in the Edmonton market, Strathcona County, Edmonton. Those will be uh, officially launched in the next month or so as well. So we have some fueling infrastructure to support those uh, those demonstration buses, and the fueling is. Uh, you know, for places like Edmonton, again, cold winter climates, maybe not, not that cold today, but typical winter is a little bit colder. Um, you know, battery electric, you know, have a lot of value, but they, they may struggle a little bit more if you have to keep that bus warm in wintertime. So the city of Edmonton uh, will probably have a portfolio of different zero emission uh, buses, but hydrogen could play a very significant role as part of that portfolio. I mentioned the airport already, lots of interesting examples. Uh, you know, one I'll highlight is Zero Avia. They're the world leading company uh, working on hydrogen aircraft. They've chosen Edmonton as the location to test some of the refueling infrastructure for their zero emission aircraft. So again, we're gonna be on the radar globally as with the work going on at the Edmonton International Airport. You'll see some Japanese partners here as the join as a Japanese infrastructure organization. So they're really, you know, looking at Edmonton as a place to uh, begin testing certain types of products and technologies, given uh, the strong focus here on hydrogen. The locomotive project with CP Rail, that's in Calgary and Edmonton. So again, we see uh, hydrogen trains uh, beginning to roll out in Europe, but they, their trains are so different than our trains with these freight locomotives that are, you know, two or three kilometers long. So this is the first of its kind hydrogen fuel cell, the Ballard fuel cell being uh, put in place in that locomotive. And you may start to see those, you know, moving around the Edmonton yards very soon. And finally, a blending project. Uh, this one's been put on pause right now by ATCO because they're still waiting some some further conversations with the uh, the standards organizations, but beginning to inject a very small amount of hydrogen, you know, only you know, up to 5% within the natural gas distribution system in this, the city of Fort Saskatchewan. So they want to keep moving ahead with that project, but they're they're just waiting for some policy signals as well from from governments and from the uh, the, the uh, appliance manufacturers. Uh, the feeling is, you know, there's no problem with 5% hydrogen uh, within the natural gas lines, but uh, want to make sure everyone's comfortable with that as they move forward with that initiative. And maybe just lastly, I'm going to highlight uh, workforce issues. This might be relevant for, for uh, Concordia in particular. We've been working with a, a synthetic modeling group out of Edmonton, or I guess a digital digital modeling company called Run With It Synthetics, and uh, really trying to, let's start to look at the workforce around hydrogen. You know, it's a huge opportunity. But uh, what, what will it mean for our workforce? So, you know, they've done some interesting uh, modeling, uh, kind of building in some learnings from other markets like Houston, for example, and what they're seeing there. And, and really the thought is, yeah, the, the oil and gas workforce of today is going to change by 2044. You know, the demand for oil is probably, you know, maybe hitting its peak fairly soon. Not everyone will agree with that, but... Uh, that's, you know, some of the international experts are saying that. So you might see a bit of a drop off in, you know, the workforce for oil and gas. It's not going away, but it might be reduced somewhat. But there's this new wedge of workforce out of the hydrogen economy that this region, you know, could see take place between now and 2044. And it's it's quite significant. It will actually more than offset that reduction we're going to see in oil and gas. So it's a net, net increase in jobs. 
And you can get a bit of a sense, what does that demographic look like? Again, just based on what they call the synthetic Edmonton population, the workforce of the future, a much younger workforce, of course, for hydrogen, a more diverse workforce as well. And what they've done is they've actually plotted this, you know, on this regional map of the Edmonton region. And this is really important for Edmonton Global because we've got, you know, our municipal partners in places like Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, lots of energy workforce there exists today. And, and they can be part of this uh, hydrogen workforce of the future. So some really cool modeling. Uh, we're going to be talking more about this over the coming months as we have some major events around hydrogen taking place. Um, and maybe just the last message is, um, you know, the lesson learned from all the work on hydrogen is, you know, we want to focus on the hydrogen value chain and where those critical links are, where those gaps in the value chain. The thought is, you know, we really don't have that much difficulty producing hydrogen in this region. And in fact, clean, low carbon hydrogen. Uh, but what do you do with it? How do we get that to market? What's the, the transportation system to move hydrogen like, whether it's domestically within the Edmonton region? or internationally for exports. And once we have hydrogen in place, you know, what else do we need? What other infrastructure? Where are the fueling stations? How do we take a, a organized strategic approach to all of this infrastructure? What are the incentives for hydrogen use to build up demand? So that's really where the hydrogen hub is placing a stronger focus, not so much on the production side, lots of other players are in that space, more in this center space around transportation, refueling and, you know, working with the end users like municipalities, uh, like the trucking companies, building operators. So that's, you know, where you'll you know, hear about a bit more focus over the, the next several years as the hydrogen hub continues to move forward in Edmonton. And yeah, that's just the rest of that one there. Things like corridors becomes important as we not just talk about Edmonton, but other key uh, uh, hubs across Western Canadian corridors, Calgary, Medicine Hat, those hubs are moving ahead in Alberta, other parts of British Columbia, parts of Saskatchewan. So we will need to have an organized, integrated system. And that's really about it. Just the next steps for, for our work here is continuing to work with Canada and the implementation or the federal government with the implementation of the Canadian hydrogen strategy. One thing we're really interested is in is making sure we have a, a rigorous approach to measuring carbon intensity because we need to get off talking about the hydrogen colors. You know, you can produce hydrogen from electricity in Alberta, but if most of that electricity is coming from natural gas, that's not necessarily going to help you too much on your, your CO2 emissions. Um, you know, we have an Alberta hydrogen roadmap. It's exploring things like, you know, how does how is hydrogen treated within the natural gas utility framework? Uh, continued rollout of uh, initiatives through the Hydrogen Center of Excellence uh, under Alberta Innovates, looking at the export opportunities working within our regional hub to continue rolling out that strategic vision for the region, uh, scaling hydrogen demand and uh, continuing to engage with industry and how it can become more involved and with the post-secondary communities as well. I don't want to forget about that. And what just very recently we, we saw a federal announcement uh, about a week ago and Edmonton Global was the lead on that. So I'm really excited by this because what we're now beginning to do is do a bit more work on the hydrogen supply chain so helping our existing oil and gas energy companies, you know, pivot their business models towards the hydrogen economy. So uh, working with another partner on, on some, uh, some training there, uh, looking at mapping out who are all the companies we have in this region. We might have, you know, I'd say between 200 and 2000 energy companies that can play a role in the hydrogen economy. So let's be more precise on who they are and how they can play a role and be part of these larger investments and uh, continuing to support the need to understand uh, you know, where more training will be required in the hydrogen economy, uh, whether it's in transportation, in construction, pipelines. Those are just a few examples that we're going to focus on. And uh, that's, that's it for me. Just I want to highlight a couple of big events that are taking place uh, on February 7th. If you haven't seen that one yet, you should check out the Hydrogen Summit. So it's organized by the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub. I've heard it's going to be anywhere from you know 300, maybe as many as 600 people at this event. So it's just getting a huge amount of attention right now. And uh, the other one was the Edmonton, uh, or sorry, the Canadian Hydrogen Convention, April 25 to 27, uh, and that's going to get probably 6,000 people coming to Edmonton for that event. This is the second one, so really uh, excited to see uh, so much interest in these different events. So that's it for me. Sorry, I went a little bit long on that, but happy to take any questions. Brent, uh, Cam McNeil, um, I am very impressed with uh, what you've done. It's um, a, a real um, a step in the right direction. Um, over 30 years ago, I um, uh, took part in a federal government um, 
um, a project to look at um, uh, electrolysis uh, from uh, Candus. And um, the problems at that point uh, were fuel cells uh, and um, uh, pipelining. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the difficulty of um, um, uh, uh, hydrogen liquid, uh, um, uh, liquid hydrogen. Um, can you uh, comment on progress that's been made? Um, probably not to a huge extent. I mean, I know on the nuclear side, there, you know, we still hear about that as well, particularly small modular reactors, SMRs. Um, you know, what that can play a role in hydrogen production from electrolysis, as you've mentioned. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that will necessarily be the focus for the Edmonton region. It might be the focus for other parts. I know the oil sands companies are still looking at uh, SMRs more for their, you know, their, their requirements for steam generation. Uh, but, you know, maybe there's some synergies there as well. Um, I'm not as familiar with you know, the, I know there's an issue of the quality of hydrogen being used for fuel cells, and it does require much higher quality, 99.9999. Um, so others may have a bit more understanding. I know we have a lot of people that have expertise in fuel cells. Um, so that that may, um, my understanding, and this, I may be wrong, is, you know, some hydrogen production will need some additional um, I'll call it upgrading, for lack of a better word, to get you to that 99.99 level purity for fuel cell. Um, I thought electrolysis generally provides a pretty high degree of quality now uh, that, that can you know, be fuel cell ready. Um, but my, my understanding is that that additional upgrading of your hydrogen you know, isn't a, a massive cost. And you know, it's something that the, uh, the hydrogen producers are, are planning, whether it's hydrogen from natural gas or other technologies. Um, and then we look at things like a dual fuel technology where you don't need that that high level of purity. You're not running a fuel cell. You're just combusting the hydrogen. So that might support, you know, different types of hydrogen production that don't require quite as high a purity as what a fuel cell is looking for. So that, that's what all I can say. I don't have enough expertise uh, really in fuel cell technology to, to say much more. What about um, uh, storage of liquid um, hi uh, hydrogen and... Um... Uh, pipeline. Yeah, I mean, I would probably, what I need to refer you to the work of the Transition Accelerator, they've done a, a fair bit of work on uh, pipelines and hydrogen. Um, you know, I think storage is still one of the areas that we need a bit more work on. There's some focus on underground storage of hydrogen and salt caverns. We have some of the, the appropriate uh, geological formations around the heartland. So there's some interest in that. You know, I think there's, there's challenges around the long-term, you know, surface storage. Uh, the, the types of infrastructure required for that. And, and the point I like to make is, you know, if any jurisdiction across North America or across the world can play a role in things like hydrogen storage, it should be Edmonton, where we, you know, we've got some of those manufacturing capabilities, the metallurgical uh, understanding to be able to play a role there. So we're also looking at some novel technologies being developed elsewhere that they're looking to bring it into this market because it may be able to avoid some of those current challenges around large scale hydrogen storage. Um, pipelines, I think that's, that's one of the big questions is, you know, what's the best way to move hydrogen uh, to markets, particularly the bigger export markets. Right now, you know, the focus is on producing ammonia and then, you know, using ammonia probably by rail initially out to Prince Rupert for these initial projects focused on the Japanese, the Korean markets. Uh, you know, the thought is longer term, if we're going to really develop this opportunity, how do we move it at a larger scale so we're not just focused on rail for, for the foreseeable future? But, you know, is it an ammonia pipeline? Is it a hydrogen pipeline? Pluses and minuses, trade-offs to each of those. There's other types of uh, all, you know, novel liquid organic hydrogen carriers. None of those have seemed to kind of, uh, you know, become competitive yet, but we need to keep an eye on that as well because there's some interesting developments taking place uh, around the world. And again, they, they may be well-suited for, for us at some point in time. Brent, um, uh, how can we at the McNeil Center and Concordia more generally uh, help you? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, one is just making sure you're plugged into the different initiatives, um, you know, through the Hydrogen Hub, the event taking place in February, more just from the point of view of, you know, becoming more aware of who some of the key players are. 
um, as we move down this pathway around training needs identification, you know, so there's been some initial conversations with some of the post-secondary institutions. Um, I think Concordia has been pulled into some of that work as well. So if we start to identify, you know, I'll, I'll use an example that may not be appropriate for Concordia, but our, tra our transportation sector, as they move to fuel cell trucks, they're saying, well, this is all great. You know, we might have the, uh, the companies like Hyundai providing you know, some, some trained service people, but they need to have their own capabilities. So where are we going to get that, that trained mechanic that can handle a, a hydrogen fuel cell truck as we start going from, you know, 10 or 20 trucks today to we're now talking about a 5,000 vehicle challenge where we might see 5,000 vehicles and a good chunk of those being fuel cell over the next five or six years. So that may be one area, but there may be other areas around, uh, you know, again, it could be the trades, but it could also be something in the, you know, called the professional areas as well. And we probably haven't spent enough time in those areas, to be honest, about, you know, what's the, uh, you know, what are the shifts? What are we seeing in new business models? You know, how is the, you know, accounting profession going to have to be more understanding of, of hydrogen as, as we look into, uh, you know, different ways of doing business? So I'd say it's the early days still. I'd say continue to be plugged in with uh, the hydrogen hub activities through Edmonton Global, obviously, uh, some of these supply chain initiatives that we're just beginning to launch, you know, keep an eye on those. I think there'll be some more opportunities that will stem, uh, you know, probably over the next year, two years around uh, rolling out more initiatives within this ecosystem. All right, Brent, there are some questions in the chat. So Isha asked, is there a post-secondary task force slash committee to work with the hub and to ensure that we are ready to meet the talent needs? Um, I don't think there's a, well, there, there is a, um, an initiative that Edmonton Global has been working on the labor, uh, labor market assessment around hydrogen. And I believe, I, I think Concordia has been part of that as well to basically, you know, work with other post-secondaries uh, like Nate and uh, University of Alberta, McEwen around what that could look like. So it's still the early days of getting some data from that process. So that will come out and that will hopefully inform some future, uh, training uh, initiatives across post-secondary institutions. So that would be one, um, you know, the, I think the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub and the Transition Accelerator are trying to think of new ways to engage in particularly the post-secondaries. So, you know, even this example, you know, they, they're in high demand to give talks. I give a lot of talks as well. So maybe there's a way to kind of provide, you know, talks like this from, from others within the Hydrogen Hub to a broader group of post-secondary institutions. So they kind of all get that message at the same time. So I think there'll be more on that, and I can bring that message back to the hub that I think there's there's strong interest in uh, working across all the, certainly the post-secondaries within Edmonton, and and to be honest, probably the post-secondaries across Alberta. Thanks, Brent. Um, mm -hmm. The only reason is that if we don't start at the same time, um, right now with the hub, for example, all the supply chain things, if the post-secondaries are um, do not start right now, I know we are aware of certain things in other other activities going on, but it takes three to four years to actually, or maybe two to three years to actually launch a, a, a useful educational program. So um, I know our AVP research is also here and um, a few faculty members are here. So let us know how we can uh, add value to what the Hydrogen Hub is bringing and we'll be happy to um, bring our resources and our insights on board as well. Yeah, no, definitely. And yeah, I mentioned, you know, this announcement that came on February, not February, sorry, last, last week, sorry, with uh, Prairies Canada, you know, some of the support that Edmonton Global uh, is receiving is going to go towards the next phase of, of the, uh, I'll call the training needs assessment. So when we have the data from the, the, the labor market survey that an organization called Malatest is undertaking, we can then work with some of our key partners to say, okay, here's what we think the, um, the demand for, for skilled workers will be it may be construction it may be other areas and here's the current training available and here's the gaps and then you know we identify a gap then we can go back to or you can probably go back to uh, advanced education or whoever you know approves some of the new programming to say yeah we think there's a, a gap here and we're the right organization to fill that gap so probably over the next year and a half we'll just be getting to uh, to move to that next phase so i'd like to make sure we engage uh, the concordia team around that thank you yeah, thank you. Um, we're just getting close to 11. So I will ask the last question in the chat. And then I think that might be it for us today. Stephen asked, a lot of fossil fuels burned for temporary constru construction in Heat, Alberta. 
Anyone working on hydrogen fueled high BTU temp heating systems, hydrogen fired air filters, boilers and water heaters for buildings, or hydrogen powered generators for construction sites, or backup emergency power generation for buildings. Yeah, there there are. I, I don't throw the list of companies at my fingertips, but but that's an area I'm kind of excited by as well. Uh, construction, you know, we have so many you know construction companies, you know, based out of Edmonton. Um, you know, I think to a certain extent they might feel maybe they're under the radar right now, but I think it's only a matter of time before you know they need to start looking at their operations. And there are technologies, stationary, uh, you know, fuel cells. Uh, there's one company I know called Onic out of. Uh, east side of Edmonton or Sherwood Park, I think they're on the Edmonton side, um, you know, they, they might be focused on that type of a, an application. I think there's many others, you know, we've had others from around the world coming to us to say, oh, we have this uh, stationary hydrogen application. I think it's the, the challenges, you know, finding the, the user of it and are they motivated enough because sometimes there is a high expense initially. But again, as you start to look at carbon charges and uh, other expectations around these sectors and how they are all decarbonizing, I think it's only a matter of time. So I think those are great initial use cases uh, because it's, you know, probably won't be doing, you know, hydrogen in downtown buildings right away. But I think there'll be these other applications that are a bit more niche to get started and you know, help uh, reduce the cost of some of these technologies as well. All right. Well, I think that will be it for the questions. Um, but thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Brent, for giving us such a great presentation. We're very happy to have you. It's an exciting opportunity happening in Edmonton. So everyone, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone.